So please put your hands together for Kelsey Hightower. Wow. My talk better be good. <laughs> you get that, that's awesome. So I woke up this morning and I deleted all my slides. So we will have a bunch of Chrome tabs in my terminal. So the, the idea of my talk was to talk about um, going from theory to production, but I felt that would probably be a bit too boring given that this is a circus. So what I want to do is focus on actually using this stuff and kind of give a reason why it actually needs to exist and why you should care about it. So what we're going to do is start, we're going to do cover three phases. One is the, the obvious phase of something like Kubernetes, which is automated deployments, right? That's the first thing people look at a system like this, say, hey, I can streamline my deployments. But I think there's something way more valuable there. The second thing I'm going to talk about is resource utilization, right? We're going to try to articulate why you're probably wasting tons of resources and you should actually care about it. Right, so if you're using the cloud, the reason why your bill is probably high is because you're underutilizing the things that you're paying for. So I'm going to try to bring some concrete examples of how you actually address that problem. And then finally, I'm going to actually talk about using the Kubernetes APIs and how that affects um, what we call the programmable infrastructure. Let's actually program against the infrastructure. So at a high level, we're going to talk about mainly Kubernetes today. Um, a lot of core OS technologies are available underneath the scenes. Um, and most of this demo will happen on these four nodes. So we'll just get started with the deployment use case, right? How many people here are using Docker? Fantastic. So I don't have to explain what Docker is. If you didn't raise your hand, just pretend you know what Docker is. Um, you would totally blend in with everyone else. So if you want to be cool, here's what you got to know about Docker, right? For most people, they do not care about security. So saying security is a problem, most people will look at you and say, I don't care. So I won't either. But I do have my Docker endpoints um, protected by TLS, so please don't try to run Bitcoin miners on my host if you see a host name. It won't work, or it shouldn't work. So what I'm going to do is I have these two Docker hosts. So when most people get Docker for the first time, they're super excited. If you're a developer, your eyes light up that you no longer have to open a ticket to deploy your application and your mind is blown. And the system admins are like, wow, I've been deploying applications for 15 years, and no one actually was impressed by that. But somehow, <laughs> doing Docker run, like this, this is like magic to people. You say Docker run, dash D, nginx. You, you run this one command, and people are like, this is magic. We're downloading something from the internet, and we're running it. And this has caused the whole industry to go crazy. Right? And the reason why is because it's very liberating to do this. We don't have to log on to a server. You run a few commands locally from your laptop and things happen. Right? So this is the obvious use case for using things like containers. Now the next step is you're a developer and you decided that you don't need any operations people. So you build your whole infrastructure this way. Right? So you have one host and you run Docker run commands and Maybe that container goes away, right? Maybe someone else comes by and says, you know, I don't think that should be running. All right, so we do a Docker PS here. We do a Docker, what is this thing? Docker stop. So one of your colleagues doesn't believe you should be running this. What happens? <coughs> now your site is down, right? And then you open up a job posting for ops people. Ops people come in <laughs> and say, what the hell are you doing? You can't run your entire infrastructure from your laptop. There are people trying this. So what they do is they introduce multiple hosts. So now we have two Docker hosts. And the thing about having two Docker hosts that's interesting is how do you actually deploy your application to two Docker hosts? Here's the first thing I see. People just have two endpoints, and they may get fancy. So instead of saying Docker run, you may migrate to something like Docker compose. And we're going to do something really disciplined here. We're actually going to use a version number. So instead of pulling the random latest thing from the internet, we're going to actually use a, a, a version number here. So since I have two Docker endpoints, I'm going to have to actually talk to two separate Docker hosts. And for most people um, that don't have a scheduler, how many people know what a scheduler is? I don't believe all of you. <laughs> the ones that don't have their hands raised, um, you're probably the scheduler. So I'm going to be the scheduler. I'm going to be the human scheduler. 
Um, and this is my pager. If I wear it, I'm highly available. <laughs> so, and I also have a handy machine database where I'm going to store all of my stuff. Um, so I'm going to show you that database now. I um, mean, this is like a very important database where we keep all of our server information. <laughs> it's really no SQL. <laughs> it's called spreadsheet. <laughs> but I have all of our machines here, right? So Docker host, um, I can actually assign them applications. So we're going to keep track of this stuff, right? This will totally scale. Look how many rows I got here. I mean, we can keep going. <laughs> like, yeah, so this will totally, this is a scalable solution, right? Um, and we can all use it at the same time. I can give you the link, but this is our machine database. So what we need to do here based on this database is that we need to put Nginx on, on these two, uh, two servers. I'm deciding that I don't want to put anything on this server. I'm going to use as my backup capacity. Right, so what I'll do is, very simple, um, I think you can just call docker compose up dash d. Again, people's mind are blown, like wow, I just ran one command and now we have production infrastructure running. And guess what, I can do this in parallel. Two tabs. <laughs> now you have a parallel scheduler. Now like, this is awesome, one person is deploying an application. To me, honestly, this is not impressive at all but it looks really cool um, doing demos, so I, I do it anyway. <laughs> but at this point, let's go. Now, for most people, they don't really care about monitoring either, right? So if this just goes down, so what? You just run Docker command again, right? Like, that's the solution. It goes down, you hit your highly available pager, and then you just bring it back up. And just make sure that this actually works. So here's the thing. We don't have service discovery right now. So service discovery is me. This is my new service discovery, right? We just add a new thing to our database. And it's on this port. This will totally scale, all right? Forget the copy and paste error. So if you want to know how to hit this endpoint, we will just give this to all of our customers. We'll tell them that they can hit this service on this port number. That's it, this works. And some people say, we're, we're good. We have our container strategy. Everything's in a database. Um, that, that's pretty fail. Right? But this is what most people have attempted to automate. They've taken this exact same process and just added scripts on top. They didn't improve the workflow at all. It's pretty much for looping over a collection of Docker hosts, deploying some bits, and hoping for the best. You don't have enough information to make decisions. Like, if someone were to stop one of those nodes, what would you do? Today, the standard quo is put monitoring, and everyone sleeps with one eye open. If it goes down, you erase, and you pick it back up. We can do better than that. So one way of doing this is switching to a different system. So in this case, in our database, we said we wanted at least two instances of this application running. Now what I could do is something slightly different. So if I still want ease of use, I can use something like Kubernetes. I won't go into the details of all the nuts and bolts. I think Toby did a good job explaining Mesos yesterday. But I'll just talk about the usability aspects. What I want to do is not necessarily track the host. I don't really care what host we have but I will give you a snapshot of what the infrastructure looks like. So we have these four nodes, and these four nodes give me a collection of resources. So right now I have about, I have about 28 gigs of RAM and about uh, 28 cores available to me. But this is no, not important, actually. I don't need to track the host names. So the idea of this whole distributed system thing is that we're gonna take a collection of machines and make them look like a single machine. Now once you make that statement is when things really, really get hard. So on the back end of Kubernetes, we store all of our data in a consistent store, etcd. I won't go into the details of etcd, but etcd gives us the consensus we need to have agreement on the cluster. So when we say we want something running, all the components can be sure that that's exactly our intention. We don't have to have all the other components be smart. So most people say, man, Kubernetes must be this big, complex system. So we're going to look at what it takes to actually run something in Kubernetes. Now in Kubernetes, everything is represented as a pod. And the reason why we have this idea of a pod is that we may have our applications be composed of one or more containers, right? So you can imagine if you're writing a Ruby app, you may need Ruby, you may need Nginx, and you may need a database migration script. We want you to put all of those things in separate containers, but we want to give you a logical way to make sure that they land in the same place and share resources, and you can communicate over local hosts. So we have this idea of pods. So right now, I don't have any pods running. But if you wanted to, without writing a bunch of configuration, so everything in Kubernetes is declarative, kind of like that YAML file that you see in Docker Compose. 
But instead of creating YAML files, you can do something equivalent and do kubectl run. So we'll kick this off. So we'll do kubectl run. I want a, what we call a replication controller. I actually want to declare to the cluster what I'm going to ask you to run. I want you to keep it running no matter what. I don't care what host it runs on. I just need those resources allocated. So kubectl run. And then I want to use an image. I want to use the Nginx image. And then we'll use, uh, let's figure out what version we want. So we go to people's software repository. And we'll pick a version of Nginx. So right now, let's do 179. So we'll pick image 1.7.9. So at this point, we've told the cluster our intention is that we want one container running Nginx in our cluster. Now, once we do this, kubectl get pods, we'll see that our Nginx pod is actually running. And what's even better is that we actually have a babysitter for the process. So if I get the, what we call the replication controllers, I've declared to the system that no matter what, I need at least one copy. Now, where did, the, where did that actual pod land? It's actually not that important, but if you wanted to know, you can actually find out. So I can describe a specific pod. So we'll look at this pod, and we'll see what happened. So in the background, Kubernetes makes a decision. It makes a decision on where to schedule this particular workload. Now the way it does that, it takes a view of the cluster and finds the best fit. And we'll talk a little bit of detail about what the best fit is. But for right now, we don't really have any memory requirements or CPU requirements, and we'll talk about why that's a problem. But we ended up picking node number three, a uh, node uh, the third octet, and now Nginx is running. Now, if someone were to come around and do the exact same thing, you know, a developer says, hey, I don't really think we should be running that particular pod, and they get the idea that they want to remove the pod. So what we'll do, we'll also watch events. So Kubernetes has a nice event system built in. So we'll get uh, the events, and then we'll watch for them. So we're going to connect to the event stream and just print it out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to delete this particular pod because I don't think it needs to be there. But the cluster state says different. The cluster state says, ah, that's a mistake. Someone killed the pod, so what we did is we rescheduled another one to match the specification that was earlier. So if we come back here, we get pods, we get the exact same thing running in our cluster again, right? No machine database, no pagers. You get this automatically because you declared that that's the intent that you want in your cluster. Now, the bad thing here is that we're not declaring any resources. Most people don't believe that the resources are a problem, right? You just run all these containers, and they have no memory or CPU requirements. So that means you may end up overcommitting your server and not know it, right? So these things start getting hot, and then they start owning each other, right? Out of memory errors, and they shut down and they come back up. This is not what we want. How many people actually use resource restrictions on all the containers that they deploy? Like two people. So I'm going to try to explain to you why this is a problem. So my wife has no interest in containers at all. And she's like, why do you spend so much time on such a stupid concept? So I had to explain to her. And the way I did it is, she doesn't care about the white papers, is I, I, I use Tetris. So we're going to see if this analogy works uh, with you all. And for you, those of you that don't use containers at all, we're going to see kind of what you're doing. Right? Here's a representation of what you may be doing. Nope. All right, let's start from clean. So we're going to play a little Tetris here to see if we can kind of figure out what you're doing with your resource management. If you haven't played Tetris, you probably had a sad childhood. <laughs> or you didn't have a Nintendo. So here's Tetris. It's a very simple game. So what we're going to do with Tetris is we're going to treat the main box as our cluster resources. And then we're going to make decisions on where each piece should land. Right? We're going to try to find the best fit for each piece. Now, each piece is different, so there's going to be different requirements. But we're going to try to see how this works. So here's what you're doing now if you don't have any scheduling or using any resource manager. You're effectively doing this. You're actually on hard mode at this point. You're on hard mode, and you effectively did this. Or actually, you're doing this, and you're asking your colleagues, hey, what should I do now? Help me, guys. Left. Left. Oh, my goodness. Right. Turn. 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 Turn.
Okay. Oh, you guys suck. <laughs> so this is what you're doing. And that's what happens. You're constantly failing because you you're not even looking at any data to make scheduling decisions. All you got is the spreadsheet, some requirements, and you're just like fire on these things on the server. That's what you end up with every single time. Now, if you use something with some intelligence baked in that actually examines things before it makes choices, you actually get better results, right? So let's see what that looks like. So instead of listening to Hacker News of uh, what tools you should run, so we, we move the difficulty back a little bit. We're actually going to play this with our eyes open, so we move the difficulty back a little bit. And we're not going to write the scheduler ourselves. <coughs> move the difficulty back a little bit. So you end up in this world where you can actually just sit around and make scheduling decisions, right? You can be like, okay, that goes on that server. All right? given that that server is preoccupied, maybe we go on this other server. Right? Now you might make some mistakes, that's okay, because the scheduler over time will defrag itself. Right? So as you're going through this, the scheduler will over time as workloads come and go, you will regain those resources, and the scheduler will have a chance to actually fill in the holes for you. Now you notice the strategy that I'm doing now, where I'm lining things up on a specific set of nodes. Um, this is kind of like bin packing, right? I don't want to waste space on things that could be reserved for a better or higher quality piece. So the way I'm scoring each of these things is based on reason. I'm looking at the whole board and making decisions on the fly based on actual data. So this is much easier. And we can play the game for a long time and we're getting actual value out of our cluster. We don't have as much fragmentation, right? So most people will say, well, that's easy to do when it's Greenfield, right? No one's Greenfield. If you're making money, it isn't Greenfield. You're right. And I'm not you, so I don't actually care. But it is reality. So in reality, what we have to deal with then is the fact that you'll be coming in with some existing issues that you need to deal with. So we have to kind of start off something like this, right? We have some snowflakes, and we're going to try to layer this stuff on top. But the truth is, if you give it time, and you start migrating some workload. So maybe you just start with like the database service, or not the database services. Woo, not database, you will be out of business quick. Um, <laughs> you might want to start with the stateless applications, right? And the applications that have no state will allow you to eventually start looking a little bit better. And over time, you move more and more services over, you'll eventually have a defragmented cluster. Now, some people will say, well, what if I have, the difficulty can go up, right? So depending on your environment, you could be in a world where, let's, let's, let's throw a little a few variables in here. Everything's written in Java. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's written in Java. And you're writing an Oracle database. Ooh. That's where you are, right? <laughs> so there's a little bit of hope for you. Actually, no. <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> yeah, nothing's going to work. <laughs> So this is why resource scheduling is actually important, right? This, these are the things that will help you lower your Amazon bill. It will help you be more efficient. So what does this translate to in Kubernetes? How does Kubernetes even help with this problem? So we'll get out of this, and we'll, go, we'll turn to our terminal again. So right now, we've just been deploying apps with no memory requirements. We're setting ourselves up for a dangerous trap here. So what we need to do is start thinking about this thing slightly different. So what we really want to do here is we want to put in some quotas. But we don't want to be the police of the cluster. I have other stuff to do than deploy applications for people. So I want to set the cluster up with a little smart. I just want to tell you what my intentions are. I know what your intentions are as a developer. You just want to deploy anything randomly from the internet. I'm fine with that. We get hacked, I'm going to look at you in the war room meeting. Mm. But until then, you will not use up all my cluster resources. Mm. So the first thing I need to do is set some boundaries for you. Now, like a video game, I do want you to feel that it's open world, so I'm not going to tell you about these boundaries, but I am going to set them. So we're going to transition to production. So Kubernetes command line tool that I'm using, kubectl, is meant to manage multiple clusters and also multiple namespaces within the cluster. So we were operating in the default namespace before, now we're going to operate in the production namespace. So what I need to do now is put in some quotas. Everything in Kubernetes is declarative. So if I want to add quotas to the system, I can have a quota specification. And this quota specification says, you know what? People in this namespace can see eight CPUs, 28 gigs of memory, 
and they can fire up 160 pods, and when they hit those limits, we'll see what happens. So in order to create this, I just do kubectl, you can do this with the API if you wish, create a quota, and now I have a quota in place. So now we have a bit of restriction, right? So now we've kind of drew the invisible walls for people. So we can describe this quota, Uh, production. So we have this quota in place. These are hard limits. There's no soft limits. You hit them, you're going to have problems. So let's try this again. The developer says, hey, I want to deploy engine X inside this thing. So sweet, go ahead. So kubectl run engine X at this version. Ah, let's destroy this one. kubectl delete engine X. All right, so let's try this again. Did we ever move namespaces? All right, now we have our quota. All right, good. So this one says we already have a quota in place. Let's try this again. So the developer wants to run kubectl run. They want to just schedule a pile with no resource requirements. So what happens here, we get a forbidden error. This pod has no limits specified, so the scheduler is going to take no action. The developer gave it to me, and when they look around, they'll see that their pod is just sitting there unschedulable. So we do kubectl get pods. That replication controller is not going to do anything because you gave me no requirements. So now we have some enforcement in the system. Now people need to start thinking. Right, so one thing we can do to help, the, help people out is, if you want to do this, I can give you some baselines. If you tell me nothing, I can give you some defaults, automatically without you specifying anything. So let's delete that replication controller, and we'll try it. So if you wanted to do this manually, what we could do is look at our pods, and we can deploy Nginx with the right requirements in place. So let's do uh, this custom pod here. So here what we're doing is saying we want three CPUs and two gigs of RAM, right? Now there's a problem here as well, and we'll see what it looks like in a minute. So kubectl create dash f pods nginx custom. So what should happen now is, ah, so this one actually fails because there's probably no room on one of the machines to actually hold a pod this big. It's, it's actually too large for any machine because I actually don't have three CPUs available on any of my nodes. So we have to correct this. So now people need to start reasoning a little bit about their resources. So let's update this custom thing and actually give something that can actually be scheduled. Maybe we'll do something like uh, 1.5 CPUs and two gigs. So now we'll recreate this pod. Make sure it doesn't exist. So this is pinning because we don't have resources. If we added a server that was large enough, the scheduler will find that and place that particular pod there, but we don't have any nodes that we plan to add. So we'll just delete this pod. And what we'll do is now we'll reschedule it or resubmit our job with the actual resource requirements in place. All right, so we'll do it now. Now if we've done this correctly, this will actually fit in our cluster. So now we actually have, we're able to schedule this job. We have resource requirements in place. If we run git pods, we'll see that it's actually running. I don't really care what node it's on, but we did find the resources that we need. And then when I go to describe the quota system, we'll start seeing things being charged against the namespace. Right, so there's a problem growing here though. This one pod has taken a 1.5 CPU out of eight, but it's only using two gigs of RAM. If we continue to do this, what will happen? We're going to end up with zero CPU and a ton of RAM just sitting in our cluster being wasted. This is like playing Tetris with your eyes closed because these things are out of whack. So what we'll do is we'll delete that. We'll do something different. We're going to add limits. We're going to say, look, we need minimum and maximum requirements that you can ever do for any of your pods. So what we'll do is we'll set up limits. 
So create dash f limits. And this is also a declarative thing that you do. So I'll set limits up, and these work hand in hand with quotas. So kubectl will describe the limits for production. So here's some, some, some ideas here. By default, if you specify nothing, then we're going to give you a default uh, CPU of one tenth of a CPU, 100 milli is 10% uh, of one CPU, and we're going to give you 300 megs of RAM by default. And we consider that ratio healthy for the cluster. So if someone were to add a bunch of pods, they should kind of use resources evenly with, throughout the cluster. So at this point, the user doesn't even have to do anything. Now, if someone wanted to roll their own pod, we do have maximums. And we want you to be a little bit even here, or um, we'll have some suggestions on the max that you can do. So we can actually try to use our replication controller again. So here I'm going to kick off this pod, and we'll see what happens. So kubectl, get pods, make sure that our pod is actually running. should be starting. The demo guides are on my side. They could have easily gotten angry with me, but they chose not to. All right, so now I'm going to describe this pod, and now let's look at the data that we get from the cluster. So if we look up here, it automatically placed resource limits on this particular pod. And since we're using a replication controller, now people are free to scale this thing. So if I do kubectl, scale the replication controller called NGINX, we can up the replicas and actually start getting better utilization from our cluster. So we'll bump it to 10. So what will happen now is we're going to try to make 10 copies of this particular pod, automatically setting the resource requirements, and we'll start to see even usage of the resources for this particular cluster. Now over here on the side is we see all the scheduling happening. So this will slow things down a bit because we do need to check that there's actual resources available, that there's no conflicts, and everything actually will have the resources that they need to run. So now that that's complete, we can actually describe our usage. And we start to see that we're only using one CPU spread across about three gigs of RAM, so we're doing pretty good on our ratio, and that's 10 pods using those resources. So given these tools, Teams can start to understand how they should be carving up their workloads. Maybe you make the pods smaller and you go horizontal. Maybe you make the pods bigger and you go smaller. But now you kind of have this control in place. So here's some tools that Kubernetes offers you to do this. So that's resource management. Now once you have these things in place, the next thing you want to do is actually get traffic into the cluster. So this is one place where people trip up on Kubernetes. The main reason people trip up is because the way Kubernetes actually handles service discovery. So one thing that you have to keep in mind is when we threw all these pods together, they get their own IP addresses, each of them. And that can cause a challenge for some people because these are actually private IPs. You can't hit them directly. Right? So if I were to describe one of these, like this one, you'll see that the IP address that it got allocated, that's not routable. If you try to hit this from your local machine, it's not going to actually work. Not just because it's private, just that the internet has agreed not to route, tra route traffic from private IP space. So we have to expose these things to the, to, the, to the internet. And the way we do that is we can use the expose command. So we can expose the Nginx on port, let's say, 80. And I'm going to, yeah, let's just do that. So what happens now? wanted to describe the service that we just created. It allocates us a virtual IP. <laughs> you also have another problem. It's also not routable. But what happens is, and we'll log into one of the servers so we can see how this all works in Kubernetes. Uh, G Cloud, compute SSH node. So what happens when we create a service in Kubernetes, everything is done with IP tables. So IP tables, and we can actually look at the implementation here. So there's a proxy that runs on every server that manages net rules for the cluster. So when we create these services, 
like the one we did for the production engine next at the bottom, we got this virtual IP. So we can be on any host in the cluster, and we hit that virtual IP, there's a local router that will step in and start routing traffic to somewhere in the cluster. Now if you think about having 10,000 nodes in your cluster, and only three piles fulfilling the service, you don't know where they are, right? So you hit the virtual IP, a lookup will be performed in the background, and it will route you to wherever the pod is actually running and does round robining for you. But again, most people don't have tools to actually send packets to the cluster on a virtual IP. And if you have decent routers, this will do it to you. You can actually say, here's a router, here's a virtual IP, and I want you to round robin to these other hosts. And that will normally work for you. So what we want to do is use something like more traditional, like Nginx, right? Most people are comfortable with Nginx. One problem with Nginx or most load balancers is it's not easy to take data from one system and import it into another. But Kubernetes actually provides really good APIs to do this. So instead of dealing with these virtual IPs, what I actually want to do is I just want to watch for when services enter the cluster, and I just want all the pods as backends so I can populate an upstream load balancer. So how do you do this in Kubernetes? One way that you do it, um, we'll talk about a project that I have called Motorboat. It's really straightforward and pretty simple. We'll just do a quick code walkthrough so people can get the gist of how it works. So simple tool written in Golang. I'm just going to skip to the meat of this function. So Kubernetes offers a web interface. We can do two things. One, we can either do a long pole on HTTP or we can subscribe to WebSocket. So here I'm going to connect to the WebSockets endpoint. Um, the way this works is we were on one of the servers and we're just going to connect to the API server from one of our servers. And we can do this with curl. So we're going to do curl HTTP. Um, we need the actuals. Let's just do this on the actual API server itself. I just want to show you guys what the raw APIs look like and how we can compose them. No, I'm not updating in the middle of my uh, live demo. I think that would be bad. So what I'm going to do is going to make this API call so we can actually see the data that we get back. So HTTP, so we'll just do a curl on HTTP localhost port 8080. And we can actually hit it on this endpoint. So what I want to do now is I just want to watch for, for changes in the cluster. It's a lot of data here that comes out. So if we don't do a watch, what you end up with is a bunch of endpoint data. And you can pull this if you want every 30 seconds. So this is actually the same thing the service VIP sees. These are all the pods that make up this particular service. Here's their IP, and then at the bottom is the port for the service, which is port 80. Now, what we want to do is watch for changes. So we can hit the Kubernetes API and actually watch for changes. So if we were to scale this particular service, so we're going to go from 10 replicas to 8, we can actually start seeing real events pop through. So Nginx, so the API server will say, hey, there's state changes in your cluster. Go and reconcile your backend. So this could be a cloud provider ELB. This could be the GCE load balancer. Or this could be an F5 if you have some integration points. So what we want to do is take that same API and build a tool around it. So here, we're going to subscribe to the events. We're going to come through. And for every WebSocket event that we get, we're just going to see what the status is in Nginx. And what we're going to do is match up Nginx backends with service names. If we find an Nginx backend, we'll pull it and we'll update all the pods for it. So what Nginx right now looks like is nothing, right? We have no backends, but we do have a service in place called Nginx. So what I want to do is start listening for uh, pods on the API server and start populating them. Now, so what we'll do is we'll deploy the actual motorboat application. And we'll do that using a replication controller. So if we look at our replication controller, I can define one. So here, I'm basically setting up that I want one instance of motorboat running. And here's the flags that I want to pass to it, the Nginx server, how I get status, and the API server endpoint so I can actually start monitoring this thing. So what I need to do now is run this. And we want to run the motor uh, RC replication controller. So if we have enough resources free, this will get scheduled. So let's make sure this works. So get pods. 
So it's actually running now. And if this works, what we should see is backends show up in Nginx. Right? So here's the current set of backends from the cluster. And now if I were to hit this Nginx IP address, so this is the public IP of Nginx, we should see that we are now round robining between the backends, right? So if we want to make sure that we can see a little bit more data here, you can use uh, Vegeta, which I was asked to use, and send some requests to it over 30 seconds. So we can make sure that we're actually getting traffic to our Nginx backends. And we see the, the load being spread across. The nice thing about the service abstraction, it integrates deeply to Kubernetes. So as we add and remove pods, it's aware of the life cycle. So if a pod comes to life, it doesn't get added to the backend until it becomes healthy. So while this is all still running, we're allowed to scale this up and down. So we can go from 8 to 20. And what will happen is backends will appear here. And then they will be added once they're healthy. And ideally, we shouldn't drop any traffic. Now, did our load tester stop? That means we need more traffic. Let's do it again. So as these things pop in and out, Nginx shouldn't drop any traffic. And over time, we'll end up at 20. And by monitoring the API server. So currently, yeah, it looks like we've dropped zero things so far. And it works both ways. You can also scale down. And since we're doing this real time on events and not polling, the system <coughs> becomes very reactive. And you can do lifecycle hooks behind all of that. So that's how Kubernetes exposes their endpoints. And everything in Kubernetes is represented by an object. And it has an event stream that you can subscribe to to build any system that you want. And with that, I conclude the demonstration. Thank you. We have time for one question. So first, who has a question? And just that guy. That's easy. Okay, good. Let's do. Let's just do that. Second question was going to be who has a question selection algorithm. But the uh, Nginx load balance is different from the ones that you run inside the cluster. Does it run on the Kubernetes cluster as well, or outside of it? So in this demonstration, I actually have this Nginx node running outside the cluster to simulate, you know, most people have this multi-tier setup where you put your load balancer on the edge and it has the public IP, and everything else is, has a private IP. And the reason why Nginx is actually able to route directly to the pods with their private IPs across the cluster is because I actually updated the route table inside my cluster that when Nginx puts that packet on the wire, hits the gateway, and the gateway will, will redirect to the right host which will then do the normal next thing and put it on the Docker bridge to have a back and forth response. I'll be walking around, so if you have any further questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey.